2 Kings chapter 9. Then Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Tie up your garments and take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when you arrive, look there for Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi, and go in and have him rise from among his fellows and lead him to an inner chamber. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee, do not linger. So the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead, and when he came, behold, the commanders of the army were in council, and he said, I have a word for you, O commander. And Jehu said, To which of us all? And he said, To you, O commander. So he arose and went into the house, and the young man poured the oil on his head, saying to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you king over the people of the Lord, over Israel, and you shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, so that I may avenge on Jezebel the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free, in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel, and none shall bury her. Then he opened the door and fled. When Jehu came out to the servants of his master, they said to him, Is all well? Why did this mad fellow come to you? And he said to them, You know the fellow and his talk. And they said, That is not true. Tell us now. And he said, Thus and so he spoke to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel. Then in haste, every man of them took his garment and put it under him on the bare steps, and they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu is king. Thus Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. Now Joram with all Israel had been on guard at Ramoth Gilead against Hazael, king of Syria. But King Joram had returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds that the Syrians had given him when he fought with Hazael, king of Syria. So Jehu said, If this is your decision, then let no one slip out of the city to go and tell the news in Jezreel. Then Jehu mounted his chariot and went to Jezreel, for Joram lay there. And Ahaziah, king of Judah, had come down to visit Joram. Now the watchman was watching on the tower in Jezreel, and he saw the company of Jehu as he came and said, I see a company. And Joram said, Take a horseman and send to meet them, and let him say, Is it peace? So a man on horseback went to meet him and said, Thus says the king, Is it peace? And Jehu said, What do you have to do with peace? Turn around and ride behind me. And the watchman reported, saying, The messenger reached them, but he is not coming back. Then he sent out a second horseman who came to them and said, Thus says the king, Is it peace? And Jehu answered, What do you have to do with peace? Turn around and ride behind me. Again the watchman reported, He reached them, but he is not coming back. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. Joram said, Make ready. And they made ready his chariot. Then Joram king of Israel and Ahaziah king of Judah set out, each in his chariot, and went to meet Jehu, and met him at the property of Naboth the Jezreelite. And when Joram saw Jehu, he said, Is it peace, Jehu? He answered, What peace can there be so long as the whorings and the sorceries of your mother Jezebel are so many? Then Joram reigned about and fled, saying to Ahaziah, Treachery, O Ahaziah! And Jehu drew his bow with his full strength and shot Joram between the shoulders, so that the arrow pierced his heart, and he sank in his chariot. Jehu said to Bidkar, his aide, Take him up and throw him on the plot of ground belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember, when you and I rode side by side behind Ahab his father, how... The Lord made this pronouncement against him. As surely as I saw yesterday, the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, declares the Lord, I will repay you on this plot of ground. 
Now therefore, take him up and throw him on the plot of ground in accordance with the word of the Lord. When Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this, he fled in the direction of Beth Hagan. And Jehu pursued him and said, Shoot him also. And they shot him in the chariot at the ascent of Gur, which is by Iblim. And he fled to Megiddo and died there. His servants carried him in the chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in his tomb with his fathers in the city of David. In the eleventh year of Joram, the son of Ahab, Ahaziah began to reign over Judah. When Jehu came to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her eyes and adorned her head and looked out of the window. And as Jehu entered the gate, she said, Is it peace, you Zimri, murderer of your master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? Two or three eunuchs looked out at him. He said, Throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood splattered on the wall and on the horses, and they trampled on her. Then he went in and ate and drank. And he said, See, now, see to this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. But when they went to bury her, they found no more than of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. When they came back and told him, he said, This is the word of the Lord which he spoke by his servant Elijah the Tishbite. In the territory of Jezreel, the dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the corpse of Jezebel shall be as dung on the face of the field and the territory of Jezreel, so that no one can say, This is Jezebel. So that's where we stop tonight. So this guy named Jehu is anointed king of Israel, and then he proceeds to kill off Ahab's royal family. This is what you do when you want to usurp a throne. You not only kill the king, you kill off everybody who has any claim to the throne at all. You want to take the throne for yourself, then you need to get rid of anyone else who might try to claim it or might have a claim to it. So practically speaking, he's doing what people do when they're making a coup. So there's that, but this story here is actually the conclusion to a long line of prophecies and a long line of wickedness. Of Israel's kings, Ahab and Jezebel were the most wicked. And it actually says as much in 1 Kings 16.30, And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. So he was the worst king of Israel, and here's some reasons why he was the worst. They made Baal worship the national religion. People before him, they made images of cows or calves and said, this is God, worship him as this way. They were still worshiping the true God, but they were violating the second commandment, making images. But Ahab went farther and said, we're not going to worship the true God at all, we're going to worship Baal, and that's going to be the national religion. In fact, it says he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah pole as well. It says he did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. It didn't stop there either. Of God's prophets, they killed as many as possible. So anyone who was trying to call them back to true faith and true religion and true belief, they killed them off. We don't know exactly how many they killed, but it would have been quite a few because there were, there were about a hundred prophets that were hidden away and they survived, but we don't know exactly how many were killed. But all of the ones out in the open were definitely killed to the point where Elijah thought he was the only one left. And when he said, Lord, I'm the only one left, God reassured him by saying, I have left 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. 
So in other words, I've reserved 7,000 for myself who basically just haven't worshipped Baal. Also, the good ones that were left were, at least by the, the description, just they hadn't worshipped Baal. So, true religion was virtually gone in Israel because of Ahab. Even God sending fire from heaven didn't change them, Ahab and Jezebel. They continued on with Baal worship, even though when Elijah was on Mount Carmel and the Baal prophets were on Mount Carmel, and let's see who answers with fire from heaven to burn up this offering on the altar. And Baal didn't send fire, but God did. Even then, it didn't change anything. And then, when Ahab and Jezebel had Naboth killed to take his land, then God pronounces disaster for them. And uh, I think I have that on the screen there. I am going to bring disaster on you. I will consume your descendants and cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, and that of Basha, son of Ahijah, because you have provoked me to anger and have caused Israel to sin. And also concerning Jezebel, the Lord says, dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel, which took place here in our chapter. Dogs will eat those belonging to Ahab who die in the city, and the birds of the air will feed on those who die in the country. So Ahab was a a bad king in all kinds of ways. He was a murderer, and he was an idolater, and he was forcing that on all the people. So in our chapter tonight, Jehu is anointed king, and as king, he's an administer of justice. He's given the sword. He's ordained by God, if you will, to administer justice. And so, Jehu, in verse 24, he kills Joram, who was king of Israel and Ahab's son. Joram was Ahab's first son, and so he took over right after Ahab, and he continued in the ways of Ahab. And then, there was another king who was with him there. Verse 27, Jehu kills Ahaziah, king of Judah, who was Ahab's grandson. So, what is happening here is Ahab not only has a reigning dynasty in the northern kingdom of Israel, he's also having a dynasty in the southern kingdom of Judah now too. His reign is spreading. His influence is spreading. And one thing that that doesn't say in the Bible very directly, but is very true, is that Israel experienced a lot of stability and a lot of Um, good economy under Ahab. And you know as well as I is that when people are doing well financially and they're not worried for their lives, people tend to think, hey, we're doing something right. But God is looking at this and saying, "Um, you're you're worshiping idols. This is bad. So there was this, this thought here that, hey, Ahab's doing something right. Let's, let's keep going with that. Verse 25. He says, Take him up and throw him on the plot of ground belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. That was the man that Ahab had killed. So Jehu is carrying out God's justice. This needs to be known in all the land that when you just kill somebody to take their land, and not just that person, but everybody who's in that inheritance to take that land, uh, God's not just going to let that go and look the other way. There's justice here. And then we get to verse 30, and Jezebel is there, and she knows what's coming. She, She's... She knows this, this routine. So it says she paints her face and gets all dressed up and everything. That's because she wants to she wants to die as a queen. She wants to go out that way. What's interesting though is that it says she appears at the window. 
there's a lot of um, reliefs that they've recovered from areas that worshipped Astarte, which is basically Baal's consort. And she's often depicted as a woman at the window. In other words, what they're doing here is they're tying Jezebel to the religion that she was advocating. She appears at the window and is basically a picture of the false religion that she promoted in Israel. And she, I don't know if you caught this, but she calls him by the wrong name. She calls him Zimri. Now, Zimri was a usurper who lasted just seven days. So Zimri did something like what Jehu did. He wanted the throne, and so he killed off all the royal family. But he only lasted seven days. Um, so she is basically insulting him here by calling him Zimri and saying, yeah, you killed your master, and you know what? You're only going to last seven days. So, he doesn't take that well, obviously. Verse 33, Jezebel meets a gruesome end. They even give us details about, about her death. Her blood splatters on the wall and the horses, and she gets trampled by the horses, and her body is eaten by animals, and just pieces of her are left. Now, that's pretty significant, because being eaten by animals ensures that you are not going to be properly buried. You are not going to have a burial. Back then, especially, a proper burial was very important. You were very much connected by family and your ancestors. You knew who came before you. That's why there's a lot of genealogies in the Bible where you come from and who your family is, that says a lot about who you are. And so, when you are buried, you want to be buried in the family, the family tomb or the family plot so that you can be connected with your family and your name will live on into posterity. To not be buried is a tremendous, not only dishonor, but a horrific fate. In the ancient Near East, no burial meant a restless afterlife. And that was kind of across the board. If you were not properly buried, that was not just dishonor, but it basically meant that your spirit was going to roam around not knowing where it belongs. And that's the way they thought about it. In kind of a, a different sort of a way, this is actually saying to us that she was damned. She is hellbound. Because this is what this is what hell is like. Restlessness. Not belonging anywhere. Or at least part of it. If you were to go on and read the next chapter. In chapter 10 there, Jehu kills all Ahab's children and all Baal's prophets. So he finishes the job. He not only gets rid of the whole royal family, but he also kills off all of the prophets of Baal. He even does it by, by deception, which that could be maybe another sermon sometime because it's kind of questionable how he goes about this. But anyways... It says that uh, if you go on to read it, that's, that's what he does. He kills off all the prophets of Baal as well as all Abraham's children. So the royal throne is his. There's nobody to claim it. Later in 10 verse 30, God commends Jehu for these killings. So Jehu, as the anointed ruler, the one responsible for administering justice, is commended by God. And I have this verse up there. The Lord said to Jehu, Because you have done well in carrying out what is right in my eyes, and have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. Now what's kind of disturbing here is that 
God orders the killing of an entire family. That's kind of, that's kind of hard, to, hard to take a little bit. So, I was looking into this, trying to make sense of this. You know, what, what's going on here? Well, there's a few things that I just want to point out to at least give some perspective on this. This was a very different time, and people thought about things very differently back then. And so the way things go down match the way people thought about things back then more than we think about things now today. So today we live in an individualistic culture where justice is dealt to each person individually, for example. We are individuals. But back then, they thought of themselves as families first, then individuals next. So back then, identity was family and then individual. Your family was your identity. Your nation was your identity. If you look at the Psalms, a lot of these prayers are us to God. Worship was more corporate than individual. And so there's, there's this sense, and there's still this way in parts of the world where if you're going to write your name out, you would write your last name first and then your given name because your family comes first. So like this is true in Korea. So when they give the name of uh, the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, Kim is the last name. And that's because in that culture, family comes first. That is your identity. That's your primary identity. Individually, you come second. And so, in that sort of an environment, when people think such ways, a punishment to an individual wouldn't mean that much. Your family is going to go on. Big deal. Whatever happens to me, fine. But when your identity is your family or your nation, it's a little bit different. And like it or not, we share genes and sins with our parents. We share their genes, and not just that. We share their sins too. At least... In my experience, in my family, the sins that we don't deal with, we pass down to our kids. The things that we don't learn to to get over or get past or correct in our own lives, we tend to pass those down to our kids. At least it's worked that way in my family. There were things that my grandfather dealt with, and it didn't go to my dad. But there were things that he didn't deal with, like anxiety, and that got passed on to my dad. He did deal with his alcohol, alcoholism. If you go back four more generations, I'm told, there were four generations of alcoholics, and my grandpa was the one who stopped that, but he also had a major anxiety problem that didn't allow him to be in certain social situations. And he passed that to my dad. My dad was dealing with that. And I'm dealing with it to a, little, to a lesser extent because he started to deal with it. So we not only look like our parents, we act like our parents too. Things get passed down, whether we like it or not. And in addition to genes... We are all part of communities of some kind, and we adopt their beliefs and their habits. We have these groups that we belong to. Maybe it's your family, maybe it's a church, maybe it's a group of friends. But we have these communities that we belong to, and we identify and get our identity from them. We don't just make ourselves, we take our cues from other people. And so depending on the environment that we're in, we will take different cues and we'll respond differently. So yesterday I was watching something about how 
how easy, easily we will conform to just whatever other people are doing around us. So they had like 10 chairs. And they had three actors in the first three chairs. And they were filling out a form and they had, you know, volunteers come in and, you know, please fill out this form, go into this room and fill out this form. And so there were these three people also filling out forms, these actors here. And a bell would ring and these three actors were told to sit down whenever they heard the bell. And if they were sitting down when they heard the bell again, they would stand up. So the bell would ring, they would sit down. The bell would ring again, they would stand up. And every person who came in to fill out these forms who was not given these instructions, they weren't one of the actors, they would see what's going on. And eventually they would sit down with the bell and stand up with the bell. All of them. We take our cues from the people around us. And if there's a group that we're belonging to, we do what they say. Or we just follow the crowd. So if there's a community that we belong to, even if it's a group of friends or family, we take our cues from them, we adopt their habits, we adopt their beliefs. We don't make our own identity, we get it from other people, we get it from the community we belong to. So like this morning, when we had a baptism, we promised as a community to help form this child. Because, forgive me, it takes a village. There's some truth in that. Because we're formed by communities. So, in the case of Ahab and his family, this was a community that was a community that was defined by murder and idolatry. And not only that, but there was a lot of success with this family and this murder and idolatry. People's pocketbooks were full and there was mostly peace with neighbors. And so there was kind of this general thought that, hey, this is the way to go. And his dynasty was spreading. He was ruling by the sword and killing off all the good prophets. And that dynasty of terror was spreading even to the southern kingdom of Judah too. So what's going on here is God is playing the God card. Because when you have powerful people and you're a small person, you can't really stand up to them very well. And so God playing the God card He's stopping an expanding reign of terror is essentially what's happening here. This is a story of God defeating evil. Not unlike when Christ comes again and it says He's going to come with the whole hosts of heaven and evil is going to be defeated forever. And it describes it quite violently. So in 2 Chronicles, it doesn't talk about this story a ton, but it does say this. It was ordained by God that the downfall of Ahaziah should come about through his going to visit Joram. For when he came there, he went out with Joram to meet Jehu, the son of Nimshi, whom the Lord had anointed to destroy the house of Ahab. This is God's justice being done. Evil is being defeated. In spite of what we might think God brings justice to people, particularly powerful people, who otherwise would not have received that justice. And it might sound cruel to us, but when you live under a reign of terror, and you see powerful, wealthy people just doing whatever they want, killing whoever they want, taking whatever they want, and reigning with terror, you have a different view of it. And when those people are overthrown, you rejoice because justice is done when it otherwise never would have. Let's pray. Lord our God, You are a God of mercy for sure, but You are also a God of justice. So Lord, when we read these stories of justice, help us to take heed, to remember, Lord, that we are sinners and to give You thanks for the grace that You have shown us 
and to look forward to when your justice will fill this earth and all the wrongs will be made right. And Lord, that you will reign in perfect perfection of perfect justice forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.